I would like to welcome everyone to our October TAMA talk brought to you by the Torrance Art Museum Advocates. My name is Janine Madden, and I am the current president and really happy that so many of you could join us virtually today. Um, this month, or this, yeah, for this talk, we are going to feature the work currently on view at the museum um, in the main gallery, the sixth uh, Sir Biennial. And so we really do encourage you to plan a trip to the museum, uh, which we are happy to report is open to the public. Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, this discussion will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel with all of the previous TAMA talks that we have uh, had. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that link in the chat uh, just in case anybody wants to check out what we have done. Okay, so we are joined today by the director and head curator of the Torrance Art Museum, Max Presnil, as well as the co-curator of Sir Biennial, Ismail Deanda III. We welcome you both and thank you so very much for joining us today. Um, these, uh, the exhibitions that are up at the TAM now will remain on public, public view at the museum through December 4th. And, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. The format for this uh, for this Zoom Tama talk is that we'll go through uh, the some photographs of what's up at the museum, and both um, Ismail and and Max will kind of weigh in on those pieces. But we would encourage you, if you have questions about pieces or questions about anything uh, for that matter, please feel free to just chime in. You can either raise your hand, uh, work in the chat, which I'll monitor and we will go from there, but just feel free to ask questions if you'd like. Um, we would ask if you're not going to be um, asking a question to keep yourselves on mute, just to reduce that background noise that may happen. But again, don't feel, uh, feel free to just chime in if you have a question or um, anything that we can answer for you. So I'm also gonna put in Jason's press release uh, for this because it really did a nice job explaining it also. So let's go ahead and take a look at the exhibit. Um, we hear the word biennial in the art community a lot. And so we're hoping that you'll um, tell us a little bit about uh, how this started at TAM and um, just give us a little bit of background. Sure, um, the, the background is um, 12 years ago. Yeah, 12 years ago now. Um, uh, a friend of mine, Ronald, um, had de uh, come up with an idea with Robert Miller from Rio Hondo College um, and, uh, and James McDevitt from Sarita's College um, to uh, do a, re a recurring exhibition which would focus on um, artists south of the border. Um, uh, and it was initially, I think, envisioned to be um, mostly concentrated on um, uh, Mexican-American artists um, in the LA area, and but also including artists who had some kind of uh, dialogue with those artists. So they could come from anywhere, um, but they were having some kind of discussion through their work. Um, so it started off small. I, uh, the, the TAM didn't take part in the first one. Um, we were advisors on the first one because um, Ronald uh, wanted to, no, Lopez wanted to do it too quickly. And, uh, okay. and we, could, we had a you know, show book, so we couldn't kind of jump in there that quickly, but we acted as advisors. Um, we jumped in the second one. Unfortunately, uh, Ronald passed away. Um, but the, the people that had taken part in the first one um, decided to continue. Um, it, you know, because it's a good idea and partly in memory to uh, Ronald. Um, and so we've been doing it ever since, every two years, like biennial implies. Um, and so um, every, how it works is there's, it varies between um, in the beginning, maybe three venues um, to the most venues we have had was probably eight um, that take part and it, it can be expanded to include various um, uh, venues, but it originally was more college based. 
college art gallery based um, and still leans that way. Um, although we have had alternative spaces taking part and, and other venues. Um, the, the way it runs is that each space individually curates their own show. They select their own artist title. We just coordinate a general kind of opening uh, together around the same kind of couple of months. Um, and that can vary quite a lot in that, um, in those dates and, and that we market the show together. But essentially it's a bunch of individual exhibitions at various venues under the guise of the Sur Biennial. That's it. Okay, well, thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about um, the, the sixth and uh, it's really not annual, just sixth biennial at the Torrance Art Museum. Go to it, Ismail. Uh, yeah, so just a few things I, I'd like to ask. So first of all, nice to meet everyone. My name is Ismail Deanda III, and it's a privilege to be here with everyone. And it's been an honor and a privilege to be invited by uh, Max Presnell to uh, co-curate uh, this uh, biennial. And so the way I kind of entered this whole process is I uh, had, again, the great honor to participate in the third uh, Sur Biennial at TAM in 2015. Uh, so when uh, Max invited me to, to uh, kind of participate, of course, you know, super excited to, to uh, contribute everything that I could and, you know, had the opportunity to exhibit my work there at the museum. So, um, you know, I started kind of thinking a, a little bit about that process of being an artist and having, you know, thinking about the best way to uh, utilize the space, utilize, you know, the, the space for, for the community. Uh, and also, uh, you know, being an artist, also thinking about other artists, I think, you know, that we were thinking would fit, uh, you know, this ex exhibition uh, really great. And then the other thing I also want to add too, in terms of like the history of the Sur Biennial, I think it's really great that Tam has been able to continue to uh, present this show, you know, with everything happening in the world and the pandemic and to uh, be able to present this show kind of during the timeline of, you know, still every two years. So, you know, 2021, um, the other venues that have participated in the, in the past, uh, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but I, if some of them had mentioned that maybe to try to maybe continue it in 2022. And so there's other been biennials around the world, like uh, in uh, Venice, the Venice Biennale was supposed to happen this year, but because of the pandemic, it's going to happen next year. So yeah, so maybe this this biennial will kind of um, kind of work over <laughs> uh, two years. And then um, I guess my perspective is, um, you know, I make installations, and so I really appreciated the scale, the size of the the gallery at the Torrance Art Museum. And so Max and I were just kind of talking about this idea, uh, how do you integrate um, our work artists that are maybe discussing multiple places at the same time? So, you know, the Sur Biennial meaning South. So it could be, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our neighbors to the South in terms of Mexico, Central America, South America. So um, these biennials also incorporate uh, artists uh, from the Caribbean as well. And so, yeah, so we were thinking about artists that um, had like a strong contemporary perspective but also how are they bringing uh, their kind of vision, their experience of, you know, being from multiple places, bringing everything together. Uh, and then, you know, many of these artists, you know, they're from the Los Angeles community or, uh, you know, different parts of the United States. And so they've been exhibiting the work for a while. So, yeah, so that's kind of where our, um, I guess, our conversation started. Do you want to add to that, Max? No, I mean, it was um, one of the things I think we were originally talking about at some length was how do we do this without stereotyping anyone and putting people into cul-de-sacs, cultural cul-de-sacs um, uh, of potential meaning. And so we were from the very beginning looking for a, uh, a very wide, uh, diverse group of uh, pra uh, uh, um, practices. Um, that we could find some way to um, establish ties between. Um, do you want, should we take a look at some of the, uh, the other artworks? So everyone can kind of see like the different uh, artists. Sure, we can either go through each one uh, like this or we could just move through them. Just let me know when you want me to advance the slide. I don't know, I'm thinking, what do you think, Max? Should we look at all the works so everyone can kind of just get a panorama sure. of the works or? Sure. Yeah, why don't we do that? Why don't we just take a look at all the works and uh, 
I guess one of the things that I was thinking about is, um, I don't know, I was thinking about like cultures, you know, or artists coming from different places. Um, so I was thinking about this idea of like kind of simultaneity and um, just like the act of moving, physical act of moving from one place to another. And so again, utilizing like the nice large space of the, the Torrance Art Museum. I don't know, I guess I was thinking about uh, artworks that could be large scale, that could be uh, almost installation or interactive. Uh, and they could also have like a, a performative aspect also to like, you know, like a physical aspect. So some of these works you can actually walk underneath, some of these art artworks you can walk around and you see different perspectives. Um, some of these artworks are kind of like capturing uh, kind of like a, almost like a ritualistic moment maybe like the, the Pettis brothers where they do these paintings that were kind of record the, you know, the Southern California kind of a, you know, car scene, low rider scene, car culture scene. And then even like Frankie Orozco, like photographing his daughter, uh, you know, putting, you know, going through the ritual, putting up, putting on the makeup, you know, celebrating Dia de los Muertos and this kind of moment of him kind of integrating, you know, like a moment with his, his daughter. Um, and then also his daughter also kind of, yeah, kind of coming to terms with like Mexican culture, Mexican American culture, but also, you know, kind of growing up in Los Angeles. And so those were, I guess, some, some things that I was thinking about. We can, but yeah, we can kind of look at all these, um, artworks. I do think some of the, the, the ways we started um, some of the discussions were to do with um, subcultures and, and how these things can kind of move in and out of various subcultures. Um, that I think slightly fell away during the process of selection uh, and in favour, and this is jointly, I think it happened very, very organically that we, we ended up shortlisting works which had um, a real engagement with craft and material. <clears throat> um, so there really was a, a far more phys um, uh, a stronger emphasis on the physicality of the of everything. I mean the photographs are large scale so you really see you know them as photographs. It, all of the other works in this have um, uh, you know a, a physical presence and you know all works do of course but these have like this real Objecthood um, of everything in the in the show, which is um, wasn't expected when we started, but became um, uh, conscious for us very quickly, <clears throat> and, and it helped us decide who the shortlisted eyes cut down to the final grouping were. Um, and we also, and I think what um, Ismail just mentioned, which I think is really important, is a uh, ritualistic aspect, because everything in this um, exhibition has a ritualistic aspect to it. Um, and we can say that through the rituals of eating and placement and organization. We can see it through uh, the ritualistic and, and, and uh, totemic qualities of the sculptures, uh, the freestanding sculptures. Um, and and the bark, the you know the latex bark of this piece, um, with its you know, inscribed texts that have been carved into it, like this, um, the uh, the the ritualistic aspects of the uh, painting by the Perez brothers, which show um, you know uh, the, the, this, this, there's a, there's a ritualistic aspect of racing, street racing. You know this whole thing is a uh, a, a thing between people, you have to have this front, you you integrate, but then you have to race to prove something. And even those are um, highly ritualized. So, um, so and if even to Frankie's um, triptych, um, which is about a ritual of passage um, for his daughter, and in some ways even having it up in, in the, as a, tri a triptych of uh, photographs like that, that in itself echoes into say, uh, Catholic uh, triptychs um, in the past, which of course are uh, about ritual in some ways. And we see these, these black and white crosses of clothing, which um, mimic the cross uh, rather than being directly the cross because they hang, um, and the burnt out houses. There, there's a, a hugely ritualistic aspect to all of this, which I think became um, uh, became apparent in the selection process and certainly became even more so in the installation uh, process. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that ritualistic aspect, whatever, I, don't, I mean, I like that 
consideration because I think maybe when people come in and see the show, um, you know, there's, like I said, there's interactive components to it. So it anchors the viewer into what these artists are doing in the present as contemporary artists, even though a lot of their uh, artworks kind of come from like uh, uh, heritages or histories that kind of, you know, you know, go back for, you know, very long, long periods of time. Um, and so, yeah, so, so just, you know, having this contemporary experience of what, what these artists are doing in this time period, just kind of reorganizing these, these materials. And then part of, um, I guess the whole thing, the, the consideration of the Sur Biennial, I think when it was first uh, originated, there were certain kind of ideas. And so, you know, many of the artists that are, um, you know, in these biennials, you know, they come from Latin America, but, um, you know, there's like a kind of a big discussion also too. It's like, how do you describe this culture? You know, is Latin America the correct terminology? So there's many people within that community where they want to put an emphasis on the indigenous elements to it um, versus, um, I guess, like, you know, colonial definitions. And so that's kind of like an ongoing dialogue within all of these artists. So um, and then, yeah, I mean, just that culture, it's kind of, it's, it's very, it's very vast. So, um, and, you know, also like the Caribbean, Caribbean also too, you know, the, the connection in terms of, uh, uh, you know, Spanish culture kind of going through there. And um, so I guess, yeah, so I mean, so I think that's one of the, like the challenges and, and, and I think maybe the good thing about like the sur biennial being happening every two years. So hopefully this, uh, this, uh, you know, dialogue um, can uh, can continue, um, and so there was something else that I was thinking of, but they can't. Uh... Well, I mean, just uh, I mean, just like a few things, just to kind of mention, like the different art. So this this artwork we're looking at, it's uh, on the left. It's by uh, Pete Hafaker Mejia, right? So he uh, he's he uh, he's from uh, Colombia originally. Um, and so, oh yeah, so like the connection that Max also made, like he was kind of talking about uh, Frankie Orozco's triptych and uh, Melissa Chiacciolo's uh, kind of hanging pieces and kind of relationships to, uh, I don't know, like a European tradition of presenting artwork in, in museums. So, you know, so all these artwork, all these artists, you know, definitely, you know, are very knowledgeable in terms of art history. And so all those kind of considerations, all those things are kind of, kind of come together in their artwork. So. Um, you know, uh, Pete Hoffaker Mejia, you know, definitely he has like a kind of very minimalist kind of modern modernist uh, connection in his work, uh, but he does use a lot of kind of geometric forms. And so he's kind of talked about that and kind of relationship to like uh, indigenous weaving patterns and how that history, you know, kind of relates to, you know, computer graphics today. Um, he also kind of talks about um, kind of minimalist ge geometric forms as a way of, um, you know, some people maybe they don't like, uh, I guess, quote unquote, minimalist work because they feel it's too cold or too distant. And so I think he uses that in his work also too, like this kind of investigation of his own uh, kind of experience, you know, does he feel distance from his past, past to like, you know, to what degree? And, you know, even these like cool connections, like he kind of mentioned how like uh, growing up his dad, his dad always had like, um, like album covers, like, you know, jazz musicians that had like these kind of geometric uh, kind of designs. And so that was kind of like the bridge for him, you know, in terms of like uh, kind of weaving in indigenous cultures and, um, you know, like his existence now, relationship to his father, relationship to having a heritage, but then, you know, living in the United States. And his pieces, you can walk around them. A lot of his pieces are just, he just like has a lot of found materials, you know? So there's kind of like a personal domestic element to it, I, I feel. But then it kind of goes in this other place, and so you know, it kind of plays around with like you know traditions of uh, uh, like the aesthetics of like a design, you know. But it's an object that is physical; you can walk around it. Then the viewer, the you know, the, yeah, the viewer has like a different relationship to this object, and uh, so I think a lot of the artists uh, kind of did that also too. Like um, like behind it, there's um, Jimena uh, Jimena Sarno's piece with the ceramic pieces on the ground. So it is an installation; oh, okay. it's sculpture sculptural you know inhabits the space but it's kind of low on the ground and um uh, yeah uh, kind of like what max was saying in terms of like uh, rituals i think a lot of these uh artworks also are kind of like indexical so we, i think we were interested in looking at um you know artists that had like a really strong aesthetic in terms of the materials that they kind of wielded and using their their works but then i think a lot of the works are indexical and then they kind of point to something else so like jimena's jimena's uh work she a lot of her work is very political. And in this piece, she was just, you know, and she invest, investigates power structures a lot in her work. So for this piece, she was talking about um, this idea of like the, the uh, um, 
like the sharing of power or the transference of power. And in this piece, you know, there's like these, you know, these these dishes to eat from. Uh, but there's also a speaker where uh, people are sharing recipes in various languages. And then, and then another thing that I thought was interesting was this definition of art in the 20th century where art is, it's something that doesn't have to do anything. It could just be a visual aesthetic experience. Uh, but then you go to some museums and, you know, previous cultures, they were beautiful objects, but also were used for something. I kind of think that's kind of an interesting thing in this work, but uh, any other thoughts, Max? Yeah, um, one of the things that um, occurred to me in, in kind of going through the exhibition a number of times is that they all have um, they all have a relationship to ideas of mortality, mainly through the idea of loss. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an, an, a border between the potential um, for, for more loss. If I look at the, the race, the car culture um, painting, these are inherently dangerous activities where the thrill partly is that people can crash and burn. Um, the uh, bark, latex bark piece um, is uh, certainly about the kind of degradation and loss. Um, uh, the the uh, the bowls on the floor, um, by definition, don't have people there. There is an, a, a there is a um, uh, it's missing the key component of people. You have the vit, you have the audio part of people speaking, but you're actually missing out on all the rest of them. Um, the the P2 wall works there both um, kind of talk about a more transcendental you know, universe, et cetera, which, um, which are missing um, that, that, that part of, uh, of, of humanity in some ways. I mean, they're, 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 they're very distant, if you like, um, and both in, and far more directly, both Marissa and Frankie's works are literally about uh, loss, um, one of loss of housing and lifestyle and, and hope through Marissa's work and the burning of these houses, um, but on Frankie's, it's about a loss of uh, relationship, a loss of time together, a loss of innocence, a loss, all these things to do with personal uh, kind of lost opportunities in a personal relationship. And, and, and all of those um, works have that relationship to loss, which I think fits in in a couple of ways, which is it fits in with the Day of the Dead idea of a culture which acknowledges loss um, as a fundamental to its understanding of itself. Um, and this is true, I think, of uh, Catholicism in general, um, in some ways, that it, uh, you can see this tracked uh, through um, Mexican history, of course, um, but you can see it tracked widely. Um, and, and I think you can see um, that there's a, a preoccupation that exists in all of these works. The, the, the um, Pete's work, for instance, the structures, um, they, 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 they reminded me when I first saw them of abandoned temples, of some kind of place where ritualistic action used to happen rather than does happen. And so, um, particularly as he puts those uh, flower uh, parts in them, you, know, you can see is these this, flowers as if they've become overgrown. Do you know what I mean? this piece, oh, here, right here? Yeah, you can see on this, if you see it on the other side, there's, it's more obvious that there's these plant um, bits uh, placed, you can see them here, yeah? That, that for me gave it a sense of being kind of overgrown and forgotten. And, and I, 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 this wasn't conscious in the, the decision-making process for me, at least. Um, I'm always aware that all works have a relationship to the idea of mortality by, you know, inherent in them. Um, but it was something that after walking through it a couple of times is that I got, it was more of a, an emotional response that there's, that all of them have a, a, a kind of poignancy that I think is related related to that that sense of loss. So this piece um, here, I understand. I think so. If we look at it from this perspective, but then if we look at it here, so uh, did this have a projected? This is a projected image onto this piece. Can you, yeah. Can you go back? So yeah. So the two white pieces. Uh, hanging from the wall have uh, projected uh, film uh, onto them and one of them is the fire uh, which destroyed one of the homes and I think the and the other one um, is the around the landscape I believe um, 
they also have sound elements in, the in both the houses on either side, not the ones that are behind the, uh, the, the dresses, but the what, two to either side have recordings okay. so you can hear um, the recounting of the, the narrative of the story for two people two of, uh, who were involved in the actual fires. And one, uh, one's a man, one's a woman, and you can hear them speaking about their experience. And then behind that, so straight through the middle on the floor, there's a spoken piece there, which is recipes being um, recounted in various languages by various people. And so you have to this whole thing, there's this kind of whispering uh, soundtrack, again, that I think re-emphasizes a certain um, feeling of poignancy through loss, because it's this, you know, it's, it's obviously something that's being recounted from the past. So, you know, and, and you know, if you hear and the, just the whispering aspect of it, because um, they they they're muted sounds. They're not super. You know, you have, you have to move up to them and, hit and listen to them, because there's this mumbling. You know, like it, I always well, you know, it's like uh, this is the land of the lost. You know, these are where the souls are whispering um, uh, to us in some way. So it has it has that um, the exhibition as a whole has, for me has has that kind of uh, atmosphere. Um, when you're wandering around in it. I kind of, I'd like to kind of add to that. I mean, this idea of um, like this element of loss or elements that are missing. I kind of feel that a lot of these works though, additionally um, have this, this strategy or this element of like lateral replacement, right? So the people aren't there with all the dishes, you know, but the voices are still there. The recipes are still there. So the artist is kind of putting that shift on how we can kind of experience uh, kind of in that, like uh, with uh, Marisa's piece with the, um, you know, with the clothing, you know, she, you know, is talking about like these people kind of losing this sense of shelter, this, this house, but then she's also talking about like, what is our shelter? What is, what is the most important to our, to our existence? And so she uses these garments that are part of the body. And she talks a lot about, um, you know, like gender issues, but also the idea of like uh, these garments being our skin and how like our skin and how, Garments can also be a, like a, uh, an element of protection or a shelter. And so, so I don't know. So I kind of feel a, a lot of these artworks also, there's like a sense of resiliency because I think if there is something missing and they move from one place to another, I think the artworks, there's like this kind of lateral replacements or maybe there's something else that kind of, I don't know, shifts in or to, you know, to kind of maybe complete that story if something is missing or, or something is at a distance. So, I mean, so I don't know, I guess that's that's something that I was kind of feeling or thinking about um, with a lot of these works. And again, you know, and I also kind of feel it's like a very kind of uh, contemporary uh, savvy strategy since a lot of artists nowadays all over the world, you know, they they use uh, kind of kind of multimedia strategies now also too. And so, so I kind of feel all these artworks, you know, definitely have these elements where they Play around with you know certain kind of notions or conventions in terms of like uh, the presentation of, of artwork. So I have a, just a pure curatorial question. Um, when all of the pieces that are going to be in a particular exhibit, in this one in particular, arrive at the museum, um, do you have an idea ahead of time where they're going to be placed, or do you sort of have to you know trial and error that in, in the large gallery? We, we actually start by um, just on sheets of paper that have got, that we've got a whole stack of them printed out with it have the shape of the gallery um, and we just kind of think about placement write names down with little like you know blocks for where things might be and that gets changed and changed and changed while better relationships are formed with objects and and certainly when um, that can change because we might have two works by an artist that we think we're gonna use and decide to go for one. Like we, we got Marissa's work here and thought, wow, it'd be really great if that could roll out further into the space. So that changed the, the decision-making on um, say the installation of other pieces. Um, and so that it's, it's a, there's an, I, we have a fairly good idea of how some of that is gonna look, um, but everything gets changed or chopped in, around um, when the installation is actually happening. Um, so 
they say these the two work, wall works here of course they take a lot of time to install because they're painted onto the wall then the objects are implanted into the wall they're not paintings um, and so that takes a lot of time so they had to be guaranteed a spot if you like fairly quickly so you know because these were installed before everything else more or less um, this piece here isn't a painting it's a no. it's installed on the wall it's paint blue paint directly onto the wall with oh. drawn, lines drawn and then those objects are made of metals and they are they have on the back they have like um extension parts that insert into the wall so that they stand off the wall they're you know they're you know they're such a, you know this kind of distance off the wall you can see so the back. this is the this is the wall of the tam this is the yeah. wall of the gallery yeah wow um, so yeah so we you know we we have to be we have to make a a concrete decision on that kind of where that's going to be placed fairly quickly because it has to be done and it's going to take it longer um, and cannot be moved once it's once it's started it's not going to be moved um, and so but from that point there's some maneuverability of everything else things get shifted um we like well, like i said before we thought that the marissa's work coming out would be better um we also um we placed uh the um the the, the, the plastic the, what do they call it um rubber this piece um we placed that in a corner um so it could come off the wall it was a little it was a, a decision that was actually probably the very last decision we made because it, it had to work in relationship to the space and the wall and we also didn't want hanging pieces in both halves you know of, of the gallery so you know so it was all you know, a lot hanging one side and none on the other side um you know but because of Mar marissa's you know, work came out that far then that, that meant that the sculptures um of pete's sculptures had to be in the second space to allow them the room I mean, it, it really is. Um, I'm, it's just like decorating. You have to <laughs> you have to decide where everything's going to go, and you know, taking on board that where the windows are and and the elements that cannot be moved. Um, yeah, you know, but, uh, but we have to be sensitive to that. And we have to know the space, and and it was you know it it kind of settled down as we moved along, thinking about it. But by the time it came to the actual install, we were we were very close to knowing what it was going to look like. The, the other thing also too, I mean, like early on, some of the some of the artists, you know, uh, contacted us and said, "This is what we're planning, and we're making these works for the show, and so this is the space that we need." So many of the artists yeah. also, you know, we kind of interacted with, one, with them, and they kind of let us know like their concept, their idea, and, and so how that could be integrated. And then, of course, you know, I deferred to Max uh, with his his expertise uh, with the space, but uh, we were also thinking about maybe uh, I don't know, in some ways, like. Uh, having not that all artworks not that all the artworks are one artwork but this idea of how they could kind of relate to one another so most um you know so so almost like the whole show being an entire installation and so like right as you walk in like what is the flow like how are the other objects kind of interacting with one another so i think that's something that we were uh, also kind of thinking about also too so not only can you walk through individual artworks but then the entire space is you know this this experience where uh, you know maybe it's kind of guiding you from one artwork to another and having some kind of dialogue from one artwork to another artwork so you know it is the installation the, the main thing for any installation is to make the works look good and to set up deliberate dialogues between the works i mean um, and so we wanted certain kind of relationships that would encourage that kind of those kind of questions about what's going on um but but and we might have a fairly good idea about some things, but there is still a movement in there. Um, you know, the, the, the way that Marissa's works were decided, that actually happened with the artist on site about, say, the, the uh, two little houses that go between each black and white hanging. That was a decision made while we were installing with the artist. And the other one, of course, is the plates on, on the, uh, the, the bowls on the floor. Um, we had that down far um more squared and it was the artist that made the decision to tilt the angle which was a, absolutely a great install decision to, for her to make you know and, and absolutely uh, support it but it, but that was her kind of suggestion what about what if i just tilt it and yeah it's so much more dynamic uh in her doing that and it also leads 
the the viewer around the space in a much better way. So, um, you know, these things are um, they're they're mutable up until a certain until you know a day before the show or two days before the show because we have to light it. Once lighting's done, we're, we're pretty much set because it's a really big pain. Um, and by the way, Candy, each of those bowls is uh, ceramic, so they're fairly um, they're fairly uh, they're not heavy heavy, but they're substantial. I okay. The artist, I think the artist mentioned the quite of like, uh, yeah, when Jimena was making those ceramic bowls, a lot of them didn't turn out the way that she hoped, so she had to throw away a lot of them also too. So uh, oh, yes, wow. so, so it was a, I think it was a pretty considerable considerable process to uh, uh, to make all these things. And then I, I just wanted to add one more thing that I kind of find exciting about this show also too, just like the proposal of the sewer biennial, but this idea, how do you um, you know, present like a culture that you're away from and, or, you know, that you've lost. And so, so I think there's some cool elements in terms of like the duality of something that you're far away from, um, but then also how do you have a presence also too? And so, you know, definitely, I think, uh, you know, Jimena's piece with the, with the voices are there. Um, I think um, Eddie Aparicio's uh, rubber piece. So he's kind of making a comment on how you know, uh, you know, rubber originated from plants in, in Mesoamerica uh, and how it became popularized and maybe the history has been lost. So I think he's kind of making a, uh, a very intended kind of uh, concerted idea in terms of like, uh, yeah, this culture, you know, uh, representing it in the space where it comes from and then how the history has kind of been lost as, you know, as, you know, this is like a, a material that, you know, is used worldwide. And so, yes, yeah, so I think it's interesting how a lot of artists, you know, have been able to kind of uh, combine those, those elements in, in, the, in these works, you know, and, but also, you know, very, you know, visually strong as well, so. How, how long did it take to um, get everything in the way that you wanted? I mean, I know you said that it was, uh, how, how far in advance, I guess, from the opening, do you begin to the installation? The installation happens within, um, hopefully within a, just like four days or something. We want okay. to have that time um, fairly compact, but um, those ideas, the, 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 the positioning of things when we're thinking about goes on for weeks. And of course the, the, the cutting down, not only of cutting down the shortlist to the artists we want, but what works to uh, include, uh, that, that, that's a dialogue Ismail and I were involved in for months. I mean, we knew I, the show two years ago, but. Um, and I was just going to say, so when you put out a call for artists to participate, how, how do you select who gets to be in? Or do you start with a list of people that you want to show and then reach out to them and see if they're willing to participate? The latter. It's always a okay. short list of people we might be interested in. We discuss, we look at various artworks, we look at where the artworks are, are they available? Um, if, yeah, this is a great artwork, we really want it, but it's in Paris, we're not having it, so that's out. Um, and so there's some practicality concerns which limit what we can have. Um, we certainly found some artists who were like, oh, that's great, but they're in New York, that, so we're not using them. Um, but yeah, that, that we can on occasion and we do on occasion, some of these people aren't in LA, um, but but the, those concerns are always present, um, and and we and we kind of you start narrowing it down because as you look at thirty different artists, say there's threads that start appearing that you find interesting, and so the discussion that uh, I think we both had was was you know much like oh but look this is really exciting well how does that work with that well it really doesn't go with this at all so maybe we follow this and see where that goes and so it's you know it's it really is. Um, far more organic for quite a long time until we get down to that final kind of grouping and then we have that discussion about well we've got five choices here of artworks which ones and why what is that relationship which ones are we and it's it's a kind of um, it's an odd working together on exhibitions is, is a kind of odd relationship because it requires um, you know being able to give ground and it requires trust it also requires you to um, 
I like to think of it as it, I, you know, you always give each person involved two or three, the kind of get out of jail free card if they feel really, really strongly about something, um, it's going to go in. Even if I can't stand it or they can't stand it, there's that kind of, there's this, my call, my call card that I can just say, I, I just really want this one. Um, and so we didn't actually have to use that on this exhibition because I think we got down to a core group um, you know, in agreement fairly easily. Um, there were other artists that we looked at after we got the final grouping, but we really felt that, um, that what we had was sufficient and strong enough and would be a really uh, strong show without adding anything else. Even though we, we, we kind of continued looking um, because things come across your desk as it were. I don't know, Ismail, what do you, I mean, do you, uh, th that's my take on how the process went. It, it felt smooth to me. I don't know, did it feel quite smooth to you? Well, um, I mean, I think one thing that I, that I thought was really great and this is, you know, compliment to Tam is that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, we're, you know, like these shows are opening, you know, during this kind of pandemic phase that we're still navigating. And so, so I think it's great that, uh, that we have this show here. I feel it's a strong show. And so a lot of artists that we were inviting, you know, they're also kind of just kind of de dealing with, um, yeah, kind of being in the pandemic. Did they have works available? What is their practice like now? Has it changed because of the pandemic? Uh, and then, you know, things, you know, things just in the world were changing day to day as we were planning the show. Um, and then even, you know, like the artworks that the artists were, were including, you know, changes were happening also too. Um, so yeah, so, so those are, you know, just kind of, you know, elements that, that, um, we're also, like I said, I'm excited because I because I feel it's a very strong show, in the midst of you know like these these factors, and I'm sure you know every show has like factors, but uh, you know just having this being one of the you know the the first shows as you know the museum is is reopening again, uh, you know I think that's really great. Well, we have about 15 minutes or so left um, in the talk, and so what I'd like to do is open it up to those of you who joined us today. Thanks so very much. Um, some new members. Vincent, I think you just joined today. So welcome to Tama. Thank you so very much. That was very kind of you. Um, but yes, if, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, unmute uh, and ask any question um, or put it in the chat and I'm happy to ask the questions for you. But uh, this is kind of one of the unique opportunities, I think, to be able to uh, ask questions of, uh, of uh, gentlemen who are both curators uh, and artists in their own right. And so feel free to uh, to go ahead and speak up. I'll just say, hello, Vincent. <laughs> and no worries if Vincent. No worries if not. Um, how how different um, well, obviously hugely different. And so uh, hugely different from Nomad where you had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of works. Um, do you have to alter your mindset when you're obviously approaching an exhibit like this and then something like Nomad? You know, I, I think there's a conscious, like we, we made a conscious decision to have this um, allow allow uh, uh, some room around the works to breathe a bit more um so i mean you have to be you, you kind of work out the atmosphere of what you're looking for and 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 how one of the ways to ensure you achieve that is is in knowing you know how are people going to move around the space how much room is it going to seem like the works have because you can make it seem um like there's much more room around works than there actually are um, by how you light it and how you place things, um, and vice versa, you can make things look um, uh, like like it's somewhat crowded when in fact it's it's very sparse in the number of artworks. Um, the 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 difference with something like this is we consider um, in the install process we are considering so many very small elements. As an example, as you can see there with Frankie's photographs on the back on the wall there. Um, yeah, it was a decision on how much space is there between those photographs. You know, it's a decision how far are those uh, those dress-like uh, shapes are going to be rolled out. Um, are they going to be rolled out to an even amount? Um, you know, the the placement of 
the wall painting with the objects on top of the back. How close is that going to be to um, the the sign and the and the temperature gauge thing there? Um, how how many inches is oh, it yeah. going to be above the floor? Um, I know these these are these are all actual questions that we we, we decide we addressed in in this. So you have to be. You know, it, it really isn't that case. We go in the moment, we'll put that there. It, it, there was a decision. No, that needs that should be at this height. Um, those uh, photographs are going to be at this height. These houses are going to be at this height. These are going to be these um, these uh, dress like things are going to be this far apart at this height. That we that even talking about how high they were, we had you know a, a discussion that probably lasted an hour trying to go through uh, options on how high they, that they were going to be installed, you know, how far they're going to be rolled out. Um, you know, these are, um, these conversations are what happens with every single artwork um, for uh, um, exhibitions like that. Whereas at Nomad, yeah, put it over there. Good luck, sure. stick it over there somewhere, you'll be fine. Sure. And speaking of the um, large, uh, the fabric on the walls, uh, we have a question in the chat from Candy, is the material cotton? naturally stretched material that is the black and white material do we know what the fabric is i'm not sure i think it's kind of like a lycra lycra-esque type of okay. material so it's kind of kind of stretchy so i'm um again very far away from all of you i am in boston and so i um, will un be unable to see this show but i'm kind of looking on the walls there are there no um and i'm a fan of this but are there no labels well, there's labels we, we actually okay. decided to place them a little bit further away than normal they're, okay. they're, they're placed a, a, a bit further away and and you know we have a minute so i always um have a question about labels in that do you do you think as an artist um or i not even do you think as an artist would you prefer someone read the label to like how do you, what do you feel about labels? And they can, they can be entry ways into some of the thoughts of the artist. Um, I, I, I think they're super useful. The, the only things I, I find a little bit more of a problem with was is when not with the labels, but with people walking around um, exhibitions just looking for the names instead of looking at the artworks. Um, I think that's a problem, uh, although it's really a small problem and you know, if there's people that are doing that, who cares what they're doing? I mean, you know, sure. they're not there for the right reasons. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not there to take care of people like that. Um, the I know that the, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, I know that the docents who work at the museum really enjoy the Friday walkthrough because they get some insight into the work and therefore are able to convey that to visitors who come in. And so I think that, um, you know, having that curatorial guidance, if you will, in understanding, I think that's one of the things about contemporary work is that um, people are seeking to sort of know because they don't quite understand what it is and the backstory behind it. And Ismail, go ahead. Do you, do you have a question? Uh, a... Yeah, I mean, uh, because I've worked in, I've worked in uh, various museums in various capacities and also being an artist and like, you know, thinking about how I want information in my work to be shared. And uh, so just a few things. I mean, uh, labels can be a, an art form also, too. So I guess it just depends on the artist. It depends on the work. Um, you know, I've worked in art museums, and I kind of feel like many times when people are new to feeling comfortable to go to a museum, I feel like many people have gone to history museums first. And a history museum will tell you exactly why this object is important, <laughs> right? Um, but then, you know, a lot of artists question, like, who says my art is important? You know, who's gonna, who has a right to say what is important, not important? But also, um, you know, a lot of these artworks are contemporary and they're made in our time. So we all uh, share a similar experiences, you know? So some, some museums will put mil minimal information because they're saying, you know what, you, you, uh, you know, you're coming from the same world, so also, you're giving kind of more free, free uh, kind of uh, more of a free realm to have your own kind of connections. And then same thing with docents also too. Sometimes the docents, they know more about those artworks than anyone because they spend so much time with it also too. So I think, you know, it just depends like the ratio on the museum and, and how they want people to respond what the artist wants people to respond. But like, you know, like Max was saying, walking around the, the, the show and getting certain emotional responses, like the docents, like they, 
they're going to get that energy. They're going to get that information. You know, that's like uh, like a visual language, right? So there's that's why artists make art. There's things that you're going to see that maybe it's harder to express uh, in a word. And um, but I know how that goes too. As an educator, I know that you know there's this theory that different people respond to different stimulus and they learn better. Some people learn better visually, and so yeah. So I think I think maybe the labels that also can be like a playful uh, art form as well too. So. You know, there's a question about this, and this is a question we, as, as a museum, have to constantly kind of address, which is, um, my, you know, we, I, I feel that people should go into this without pre preconceptions and kind of say, and start that process of trying to, well, how does that relate to that? And let themselves find their way through and, and let themselves find the conversations that they're, they're seeing. Um, we could put more information up we could say this work is about this and this works that but then there's always this well then do we have to point out the relationship of this and then then okay so then we're going to start talking about very subjective things now when I'm, when we're walking around doing the, the walkthrough it's really easy to say well I think this is like a temple to write that is a different thing to write down on the didactic panel for every one of these eyes plus more about what the show is and how to read it I'm, I'm not sure that that's a useful thing for people. It's like critical facilities have to be developed, not told. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when somebody comes up to that, and, and, and if I was writing all about this, well, if I'm gonna write that it's Kempel-like, I have to justify that. If I, and then what about, well, then how does the, <clears throat> how do the, the, the perspex and the uh, more modern materials fit into that? What parts of that suggest a temple and why? Um, you know, what, I'm gonna write a book for every artwork and every show. That's never going to happen, of course. Um, but there, so there is this kind of thing. Do we? Um, and often artists are really bad about sending that information, and one. <clears throat> and so, what we're going to spend all our time writing about the artist's work, then put them up, and then some of the artists, of course, come in and say, "No, I don't like that." I mean, it's yeah. just. It, 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 I mean, it's possible to do it. It's fraught with problems. And, sure. and the bottom line is, it's like these. Who knows what that is? But the artist has an idea of what it is, and I could write rings, and that wouldn't change somebody's subjective experience of what they, they think it's about. And so there's, there's only, you can, I, I think that you can maybe, you know, um, you can indicate some things through didactic panels that might be useful, but that, you know, nothing really, there's so many ways of interpreting what this object is, and they're equally, they're not, not all opinions are equally valid. This isn't about dolphins, you know, gambling together in the sea. Um, it isn't, regardless of whether you see it there. Um, but, but in terms of um, you know, how does it talk about architecture, it evidently does. But how? That's, that's, that's a discussion. How does it relate to what I think when I see it, which is related to temples or, um, or, or, or ritualistic areas? How does it compare because of the way it's made and materials used to Home Depot? I mean, you know, it has these um, meanings um, and, and us telling you one also limits because people come and say, oh, that's what it's about. No, it's take the time and you might see all these other things that it's about because yeah, it's, uh, this is equally about the idea of Home Depot what Home Depot is, what does it mean to make things, how does it mean, you know, what does it mean when, when you talk about how somebody makes something? I mean, all of these things are part and parcel of what this particular artwork's about. Um, and there's, there isn't, a, you know, even to the point of saying, well, how does the way the construction methods being frontal like this, how does that re refer to things historically? How does that talk about modernism? How does it talk about present the present day? What does it, what does it say about architecture and the, the, the environment the artist lives in? I mean, we can do this for the rest of the day. I was thinking and, of, and there's no way of just keeping it down yeah. in a paragraph. Well, I was, I was thinking about two things. Like first of first of all, so the some people say the good and the bad of contemporary art is that any, anything can be art. So if anything can be art. If you can choose anything to make art, why did the artist choose this material instead of that material? Why did they choose this? And so we can start thinking about that. And also like the times that we're living in also too, you know, um, I think, you know, uh, you know, more and more people are having the opportunity to go back and see experience artwork in person. So for this show, you know, that's one thing I was thinking about. It's the idea of the experience of art. 
you know, because uh, we we live in a world where there's a lot of information, you know, so maybe this is a place where we can just experience the art, stand in front of it, look at the shadows, walk around it, uh, have that experience, and then maybe, you know, have uh, safely a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone else in the space. Like, I don't know, where's the label for this thing? I don't know, what is this? You know, it's like, and so, you know, to generate that experience, I think is, is good as well. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Matt, you want to close this out? That's what an exhibition is for. It's, it's the experience of being in front of it. It's the experience of walking around it. It's the experience of looking and the experience of critical thinking and, and emotional responses and uh, kind of trying to find your way to an understanding of something. Um, you know, and it takes time and it takes presence to do that. I mean, I, you can look at this all day on the screen um, and it will never be the same thing as walking through the gallery. Lots of times you can experience the same artwork more than one time in a different uh, day, and you'll have two completely different experiences. So. Oh God, yeah. I, every, yeah, yeah. Having walked through the gallery throughout a, a run of any show, I, I re-engage with these works on a constant basis, and every single time I think about them, I, I find something else. It doesn't matter how many, even today, when we were we were talking about it um, through this, that whole thing about loss was something that struck me more, uh, um, more recently. That wasn't hugely uh, a part of my understanding of the show at one time. It was something that's become apparent through, you know, walking through it multiple times. Well, I'm I'm so grateful that the both of you could join us. I'm very happy that we um, this was originally scheduled for September, so I'm super happy that we were able to um, go ahead and reschedule it for now, for today. Uh, the Torrance Art Museum uh, is open Tuesday through Saturday from 11 to 5 p.m. And the uh, Sir Biennial, it will be uh, up until December 4th. Uh, at, as is, uh, there's a exhibition, there's a, excuse me, there's a there installation, I don't know, exhibition installation in gallery two. Uh, as well as in the dark room. Is there anything out on the patio? No, not this, not this year, until next year. Okay, um, Jason does a fantastic job. So if you are a Facebook person or social media person, Instagram, um, there's a lot, he's posted a lot of videos and a lot of really cool photos that you probably will, I snagged some of them for today. Uh, some folks who've been in, have taken pictures so feel free you know if you're at the museum and you want to throw some images out for people to look at I think um, the both of you have made some very poignant points about looking at work like this and I think the key takeaway for me at least is the idea that you really just can't come by and spend five minutes and walk around and leave I think that to really experience the magnitude of what some of these pieces and all of them actually are conveying you really do need to spend some time in front of them. And I like the idea of um, maybe not even just one time. Um, the museum is free. So feel free to come in as often as you'd like uh, during open hours. Ismael? Yeah, no, I just, I can't uh, have your you know, yeah, before we head out, you know, for, you know, first of all, I just want to thank everyone that joined this, but also, you know, I want to thank Max. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this project. And thanks for Tam, you know, keep up the great work. So like you mentioned, not only, you know, all these great uh, exhibitions happening at Tam, but also throughout uh, Torrance as well. So, so yeah, so I just wanted to say thanks for, uh, yeah, allowing me to, to participate in all that. So thanks, Ismail. That, you know, it's been, that was an easy uh, collaboration. Oh, and I want to thank the exhibition team also. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks very much, everyone. We really appreciate you coming out. I'll go ahead and um, edit this and then put it up on the uh, on the Torrance Art Museum Advocates YouTube channel, where all of the other previous Tama Talks have been uh, posted as well. So thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate it.